Ken Clark. I'm, I'm working with the Mars team, I'm a PhD student, and I'm a radiographer as well, so also work in the hospital. Um, so I'm here to share with you um, our experiences, and I'm really privileged because, um, of course, these are the first images um, in the world that have been done on real patients in the clinic. So um, this is the kind of um, accumulation of 15 years work by the development team, um, and I've been uh, really lucky to come in at the end and start scanning real patients. So um, here's our results. Um, so what's motivated us, um, particularly in the field of um, upper limb and hands, um, but what's sort of motivated us to get into the clinics? Um, and first of all, obviously, you've heard already about all the biomedical results, um, or some of the biomedical results so far, um, and they've been really encouraging. Um, you know, we've been able to produce high-quality images in bones, um, mice, um, sheep samples, um, and they've been really promising um, and obviously easy to then um, imagine the applications in, in people and in clinics. So. Um, We've shown the microstructure of the bones so far. We've shown um, calcifications. We've shown soft tissue structures. Um, and of course, we're eager to see where that leads. Um, the orthopedic applications are reasonably obvious um, in the fact that, especially hands and wrists, they're a really common fracture, um, the scaphoid in particular. Um, we look at scaphoid fractures are about 70% of wrist um, carpal bone injuries. Um, and they're also really high cost to the health service. Um, so. About 15% of scaphoid fractures are missed um, on the initial presentation, um, and um, the sort of ongoing costs of that to the patient are, are um, yeah, really well known so far. Um, in terms of the um, comparison and, and the imaging modalities we've got so far, um, we've got plain X-ray, MRI, CT scans, um, and some ultrasound as well, and even nuclear medicines used for wrists. Um, but what we don't have yet is that kind of point of care scanner, um, the, the 3D CT application in the clinics at the time that the patient first presents. Um, and really it's the patient, isn't it, that we're here for. Um, and they're the ones that have to go through multiple visits and multiple modalities. Um, and that's another um, issue that we're trying to tackle. So how do we tackle that? Um, so where we've been up to so far, um, there's been an experimental human scanner developed um, at UC, at Canterbury Uni. Um, and that experimental scanner has been used to test all of the preclinical applications. Um, and that scanner has now been translated to test the, the clinical patient examinations as well. Um, where we go to next after that is to get those scanners into the clinics. Um, so our first scanner will go into the clinic at Pacific Radiology, um, and that's at the Pegasus 24-hour center. Um, and that'll be where we translate that now to the next stage, which is to scan patients as they walk through the door with their fractures or at their fracture clinic. Um, then the next step after that, of course, is FDA approval um, and progressing into that kind of international market um, and having that regulatory um, component. Um, so where we're at at the moment is that we can scan patients for research purposes, um, but we can't yet scan patients to um, change or alter their, their care pathway um, because, of course, we're still validating the scanner um, and still kind of proving those applications. So here's the scanner. Um, this is Phil. Like you've probably seen this image already. Um, and this is where the human imaging started with Phil's ankle. Um, so that was a few years ago now, um, I believe. Um, and we, we did that scan. We proved that we can image um, people. Um, and then now, um, this year, we've been moving on to real patients, as I said. These were the images from the first um, human images from um, the ankle scan. Um, and what we showed was that we can really see microstructure of the bone, which is really important um, to see that cortical outline and the trabecular pattern. Um, and with that microstructure, there comes all those applications like um, bone strength, bone density, um, fracture risk assessment, um, and of course, um, surgical planning as well. We saw the mineralization of the bone, um, and with that mineralization, what kind of sets us apart in that space is the um, being able to quantify the density um, so we can see how much calcium is there rather than just visualizing that it looks like there's a density on the scan, and that is, we think, calcium. And what we can now say is this is a measurable amount of calcium. Um, so that has applications then, of course, in measuring those trends over time. Um, and we've seen soft tissue um, in those structures. So you can see from those images that um, we're starting to see where tendons might sit um, and ligaments. Um, and we're still exploring um, where that goes in terms of soft tissue imaging as well. 
and we can make some 3D pictures too. <laughs> <laughs> we like them, they're really good for um, understanding the, the kind of 3D viewpoint of the, the bones, the wrist. Um, they're not so, um, clinically, they're not so used for diagnosis, um, but for the patients, um, for people understanding the, um, the image, um, they, they're really, really good. <laughs> And as you kind of put those two, um, our Mars images, side by side with the CT and the MRI, you can see that um, where we've initially started with our clinical trials is to compare our Mars images against the CT scan. Um, but it's really easy to imagine, actually, that we should also be moving into the space of comparing our Mars images against an MRI scan. Um, CT scans known for the um, bone structure imaging, uh, really good resolution in there, um, in the bones, but also some good soft tissue resolution. Having said that, if the patient has a soft tissue injury, they end up in MRI. They don't end up there straight away, but eventually um, they do get there. So um, that's what we're really excited about, of course, with the calcium, the fat, and the water imaging from um, Mars has that kind of potential to be compared directly against MRI. So again, here's the scanner, and this is where our clinical trial started. This is the scanner at UC. Um, and we have got, you can see on the left-hand side there, you can see the um, X-ray tube, on the right-hand side, the detector. Um, and then we've got that Perspex tube sort of projecting out from the side. Um, and a lot of the work that we initially did to get the patients on the scanner was around that Perspex tube. <laughs> um, and it's about how do we position the patient, where do we put their hand, what's a stable platform? so it doesn't wobble, so that it's comfortable for up to 20 minutes. Um, and do we need different shapes of that Perspex tube? Um, hands, feet, ankles, toes, knees. Um, so there's been a lot of kind of collaboration and discussion um, just relating to that one component, um, aside from the, getting the actual scanner to be um, up and running. With the scanner, for the wrist scans, we've scanned at 120 kV, um, 310 microamps, um, which is a really small tube current, um, over a scan time of about 22 minutes for eight centimeters of tissue. Um, so eight centimeters kind of runs us from the metacarpals down to the distal radius um, with, with plenty of space. Um, we, from there, we produced five energy images. So um, those images are binned into um, the different energy levels um, with that spectral photon counting detector that I'm sure you've heard about already. Um, so we produce those energy images, and we also produce a set of calcium, lipid, and water channels um, with a dose as low as five microsieverts, um, which is significantly lower than the CT scan that the patient would have otherwise had. And then where do we go from there? with that kind of scanner. Um, for hand and wrist imaging, it's really important, as I said, to get those images at the time when the patient's in clinic. Um, so to do that, the, the team have designed the um, arm and wrist scanner um, that will be operational really, really soon. Um, and the patient can simply put their arm in that gap and sit there, watch TV, uh, read a book, look at their phone, um, and be scanned at the time that they present to the clinic. So again, really excited about that kind of development. And I just thought I'd share with you now um, our patients and our patient experience, because of course we owe all of this um, progress um, in part to them as well. So I just the day before lockdown, I rang the first patient and said, can I invite you to have a Mars scan? Um, and it's not really a well-known scan. So um, I went through the technicalities of the scan. Um, obviously, um, there isn't necessarily a benefit for that patient, but um, he's contributing to future patient pathways. And so he had, luckily, actually, he had a lot of questions um, all about the scanner, how it works, what that means for him. Um, and after a long conversation, I said to him, you'll be the first in the world. And he said, sign me up. <laughs> um, he was really, really excited to be you know, in that pathway and making a change. Um, young guy, early 20s, um, he'd had a fracture um, overseas. Um, but that fracture overseas, he brings back to New Zealand um, and that health system kind of um, pathways he's having here, not where he had that fracture. So, um, so he came back, um, he had his fracture in December, and then he'd had multiple x-rays, CT scans in the meantime. That fracture from his first x-ray was missed, and that now has ongoing consequences for him. Three months after his initial fracture, he'd had a CT scan, and then we scanned him on the Mars scanner. 
Um, and then now he's actually having surgery, or he's had surgery, he's got a screw in his wrist, um, and he's still having ongoing pain, even now. So the costs are, are huge. Um, you know, six months loss of income, he's actually a manual um, worker, um, works in trades, so he can't actually work with a wrist that's painful, swelling all the time, and doesn't really move. Um, so he's still not at work, even after that original fracture. Um, loss of quality of life, it's painful, it's distracting, um, and it's stopping him from progressing on beyond that injury. Um, he's had two surgeries now, um, he's had multiple scans. And here's our image, this is our first Mars image on the patient, um, and you can see that's an energy image, so we can see his screw, we can see his um, area of his fracture just here, just there, um, and we can see the different densities in that region of his scaphoid. So from there, we produced a range of color images. Um, we had a huge amount of data from this patient. We produced on the left there, you can see the calcium, lipid, and water channel um, with the screw highlighted in green, um, and then some 3D images and a whole set of black and white um, grayscale images as well. And from there, it's kind of, you know, where do we go? What, what do we do um, with all of this data? And really, we need to focus on what the surgeon actually wants to see because we've got the facility to produce images, um, but we need to produce images that are clinically useful, that are gonna make a difference to the people that are gonna be using them. So, um, so we spoke to the orthopedic surgeons, um, and one particular surgeon confirmed that um, initially what he wants to do with this Mars image is to confirm the fracture. So preoperatively, before that screw goes in, he wants to find the fracture, have a look at it, um, and classify it have enough 3D information to, um, to say where it is and what that fracture looks like. He also, in that space around the fracture, wants to see if there's any um, evidence of union, particularly if it's further down the line. So is there any calcium in there? Um, is there any evidence of necrosis or um, non kind of growth of that um, fracture? And before he puts that screw in, he wants to look at the bone structure and he wants to see whether that screw will anchor what the trabecular looks like, so whether it's gonna hold that screw in place. Um, and then he's got a few other uh, requirements as well um, around the ligaments, the scaphoelunate ligament in particular. So you can see there that screw trajectory, the screw planning. And then in the post-op space, um, he wants to see whether that screw's moved. So the two ends of the screw, whether it's migrated beyond those borders, so the detail is really important. He wants to see the edges or the bone metal interface, and that's a really difficult space for CT scans particularly, um, is because of the beam hardening around that bone metal interface, um, we start to lose quality, um, and so we'll talk about that in a second. Um, and he wants to see, again, the fracture site, is there any evidence of growth over time? And the joint spaces as well. So with these fractures, particularly in the scaphoid, we get arthritis either side of the joint, um, sorry, either side of the fracture. Um, so he wants to assess the narrowing of that joint space and the calcium deposits in it. So here's our scans um, directly compared against the patient CT scan. Um, so um, you can see the Mars scan was scanned at 90 microns, um, voxel size, and the CT scans in the region of about 300 microns. Um, so you can see we've already got a really high resolution. Um, and to look at that bone morphology, we're looking at the trabecular pattern, we're looking at the cortical thickness, um, and we believe, and having looked at a lot of these images so far, that we've got really high quality and high detail um, in that bone morphology space um, as compared to the CT scan. In terms of the bone metal interface, um, the images here, you can see there's that black margin around the um, screw just here and around here, um, and that's a typical beam hardening artifact. On our Mars image, we believe we're getting much closer and much more detail around that bone margin. Um, so that was information we'd seen in the biomedical research, and now we're replicating that again in the clinical space. We also measured the size of the screw. The screw itself was 21 millimeters. Um, the Mars scan, it measured 20.9. The CT scan, it measured 22. So we think we're getting a little bit more accuracy, and that's because of the artifact that develops around the screw as well. In terms of the bone mineralization, what we did was we measured at the distal pole, just up here. So we measured the calcium density and content and quantified it at the distal pole. You can see at the um, scaphoid waste, you can see a clear loss of density in the middle, a loss of calcium. 
at the proximal pole, you can see an increase of calcium in terms of volume compared to the lunate, which is just next to it. So having that statistical information is new um, and potentially useful, of course. What we can also try and understand is that necrotic um, process, the osteonecrosis, that is a really high risk of with any scaphoid fracture. Um, so what we did is we measured the regions within the fracture area. Um, so you can see region one has a really high lipid density. The image shows reasonably clearly the patch in yellow, but to be able to measure it on a, a grayscale image as well, and um, to say actually the lipid content in there is reasonably high. It's also got quite a high water content and a reasonably low calcium content. The region just slightly more distal has a higher calcium density, a higher water density, and less lipid. Um, now what this means um, is something we're still working on. Um, so, um, of course, we haven't seen this kind of information before. Um, so what it'll be a case of is gathering a lot of wrist images from uh, fracture clinics, um, from our point of care scanners, and really understanding that osteonecrosis process uh, for the first time, essentially, um, with this kind of information. So what's normal, what's not normal, um, how much should be there, what does that, how does that change over time? An added bonus, um, you know, a lot of patients that fall on an outstretched hand particularly, um, they end up with distal radius fractures or scaphoid fractures. Um, and particularly elderly um, women um, over sort of 50, 60, um, they're going to start, they're starting to lose bone density. Um, so they're already at a higher risk of fracture. Um, and so what normally happens is those patients go and have a bone density scan once a year or once every two years. Um, often they pay themselves um, somewhere in the region of a few hundred dollars. What, we, um, what we've got the opportunity to do with this Mars scanner is to measure their bone density at the time that they're assessed for the fracture. So they don't need a Mars scan and a bone density scan. Um, so what we can do is we can segment the cortical outline just here, um, and we can measure that cortical thickness. So in measuring that cortical thickness, we can start to suggest that they may well be losing bone density and they may well be at higher risk of a fracture. Um, so we've measured the bone density, and, uh, sorry, the cortical thickness, um, and you can see the Mars scan does vary slightly from the CT scan. From this data set particularly, we can't tell which one is the most accurate. All we can say is that we're similar, um, and our cortical thickness is measuring just slightly more. Um, and then here again, we've measured the um, calcium content, or the, the um, density in the cortex and the density in the trabecular. So as a one snapshot, not necessarily useful for the patient, but as a snapshot over time, definitely would be. So um, that's all the information we got from our first patient, just our first um, early 20s young guy. Um, where could Mars have helped this pathway? We've, we've sort of already mentioned that actually if we could have scanned him earlier, we may well have, well, we, we wouldn't have missed his fracture. Um, so that's uh, quite easy, um, easy to see that success. Um, we also could have imaged him when his pain didn't settle after a few weeks. So normally at that point, patients would be potentially referred to MRI um, or CT. Um, they could easily be referred for a Mars scan and get all of that data. Um, and again, in the post-op space, we've talked about it, but the patient could be um, having their Mars scan at that point and get all of that um, surgical kind of success information. could have that from his point of care scanner. <laughs> so our second patient, um, this was, um, actually this was our um, third patient, but this is a 56 year old female. Um, again, scaphoid non-union. And that message was coming out from all of our scaphoid patients. I had an x-ray, my fracture was missed, and now I'm in pain. Um, and this is again a few months down the line. Um, so this lady, these are our, both of our Mars scans. Um, this is our um, energy image, and we can quite clearly see the fracture. We can see she's got a transverse fracture across her scaphoid waist, which is really common. And then we've got that calcium density map where we've quantified these regions, and we can see that actually there's sclerosis building up at that fracture margin, which means that it's unlikely that that fracture is going to heal. The more sclerosis builds up at the margin, the less healing there'll be between the two bones. Um, so having that information is really helpful. Um, it's also allowed us to see if there's any kind of forward or backward displacement of that bone. Just here. Third patient, same story. Um, uh, Mid-50s, um, had a fracture, missed, and now there's a non-union of that 
that bone. Um, slightly different look to these images, um, but what we can see here on the first set is um, a really a really lucent region. Um, but actually, when you look closely, you can see there's a little bit of calcium in there. Now, on a grayscale image, a little bit of calcium seems kind of promising, um, but knowing how much calcium and where it is is really important. So the surgeon said, um, the CT report says that we've got some bone bridging, but he wasn't convinced of that bone bridging. Um, and this Mars scan is providing that kind of information. We can see that there's a little bit of bone bridging in the middle, but again, nothing on this side and nothing on this side. So we've got really high detail there. Um, and here from our energy images, sorry, from our material images, we can see the content of that in terms of water, lipid. Is there any lipid in that necrotic site? What we were also really encouraged about in this image was the trabecular pattern um, and the resolution there. Really, really good detail. And we produced some 3D images as well. So the patient obviously was really impressed with those. The other thing that we've been sort of looking at is those soft tissue structures. Um, and again, the, the realm of MRI, um, really. But as we kind of start to produce these um, energy, uh, these material images, then we can start to imagine that maybe this is the collateral ligament coming around here. And potentially here, I can see a line just coming across this way, um, which I believe is the scapholunate ligament. Um, again, this is something that we're working on and confirming, but to know if that ligament's ruptured is clinically relevant. Um, and I believe that we're starting to get those images where we can see those structures as well. And you can see on the volume range, a really clear soft tissue resolution there. Also now, as we start to move to point of care scanners, we um, are moving into the acute fracture space. Um, so we haven't scanned any wrists at the acute fracture stage yet, um, but we have scanned a patient's foot. Um, and this patient was only um, six days post-injury. And so that was, again, another challenge in terms of getting the patient on the scanner. Um, how are we going to position him? He's got pain in his foot. Um, and we managed to position him lying on his front with his foot stretched out um, with a few straps to kind of keep him in place and a few cushions to support the rest of his body. Um, so that was successful. And we've learned a lot from that and from the positioning of our other patients to make sure that as we move into the clinic, we can deal with patients with other injuries, with new injuries, um, and help them not to move over that 22-minute scan. Um, so we can see his fractures reasonably, well, really clearly, just here and here. And then we produced some really nice um, material images from here. And that was, again, really encouraging around the soft tissue ligament assessments as we start to see the difference between all of the images combined, the lipid and the energy channel, and then the water and the energy channel. We start to try and map out those um, areas and, and start to think about what they might be made of composition-wise and how that matches with our image. So quite encouraged by that as well. And the same thing in an axial view. And a 3D. So we've shown, hopefully, um, we've, we've shown that we've translated that scanner from the biomedical and um, preclinical space to, to humans. Um, the clinical trials have started. They're ongoing. Um, and they're scaling up. Our machine has got from being a, a large um, preclinical scanner to being um, a small point of care scanner. Um, and that will be ready really, really shortly. Thank you.